Brazil is set to implement new entry restrictions for certain foreign nationals. I was raised in a working class family. My mother required food assistance for periods of her life. My grandmother required social security help to raise me. In the coming weeks, we will present our plan to rebuild a stronger, more resilient Canada. Today's episode is quite the buffet. All bets indicate that Trudeau is finally throwing in the towel and will be setting the stage for an election very soon. And Brazil sets the stage for a massive lockdown on illegal immigration. But first, we're starting with J.D. Vance's intro into the vice presidential debate. Not even out of any kind of partisan politics, but the sheer cunning that was behind it. Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War, has been a field guide for many a politician and there are many quotes and insights in that book that lead to nonviolent combat, including these two quotes. Supreme excellence consists of breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. And the other quote being, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And like I said, these are just two of many in Sun Tzu's book. Vance is no doubt a student of the art of war. The first 11 seconds of his delivery are gracious and pull his personal brand far away from Trump's trademark brashness. So, Margaret, I want to answer the question. First of all, thanks, Governor. Thanks to CBS for hosting the debate. And thanks, most importantly, to the American people who are watching this evening and caring enough about this country to pay attention to this vice presidential debate. Despite him and Walsh being opponents, he's referring to both of them and says, no one knows who either of us are. Right there, he's subtly destabilizing his opponent with inclusivity by saying who we are rather than who I am. I want to answer the question, but I want to actually give an introduction to myself a little bit because I recognize a lot of Americans don't know who either one of us are. He's also presenting an extra added air of humility by downplaying how publicly known he actually happens to be. Even before he came in as the VP, everybody knew him as the hillbilly elegy guy, so he's not exactly a nobody. I was raised in a working class family. My mother required food assistance for periods of her life. My grandmother required social security help to raise me. And she raised me in part because my own mother struggled with addiction for a big chunk of my early life. Here, Vance does a number of things in one swoop. The first thing he does is starts to tell a story, which is a skill all politicians should focus on mastering, storytelling. But not only is he telling a story, he's telling a relatable story. Struggle is everywhere right now. Many people are having a hard time with everyday life and Vance quickly shows the audience he knows where they're coming from. While doing this, he's also inflicting damage on Tim Walz because while the Democrats are the party of social programs, Vance is the guy who's actually lived the reality of the people who might be counting on those very social programs. Tim Walz isn't. While Tim did not come from a rich family, he still had far more stability and comfort than Vance ever could hope for while growing up. I went to college on the GI Bill after I enlisted in the Marine Corps and served in Iraq. And so I stand here asking to be your vice president with extraordinary gratitude for this country, for the American dream that made it possible for me to live my dreams. Once again, Vance does the exact same thing here. He mentions his service in the military, which automatically endears him to other vets. Not only that, but he openly states that the military life was his key out of poverty, which it has also been for millions of other Americans. Once again, relatability. And finally, this is a very classy way to attack Tim Waltz's stolen valor without any direct mention of it. And most importantly, I know that a lot of you are worried about the chaos in the world and the feeling that the American dream is unattainable. I want to try to convince you tonight over the next 90 minutes that if we get better leadership in the White House, if we get Donald Trump back in the White House, the American dream is going to be attainable once again. And that's what I love most about this. After all that, Vance wraps up his opening message in a nice shiny bow of hope and promise while Tim Waltz is left wondering how he could possibly follow up on something like that. And the answer, Tim, is nothing. Since we're on the topic of putting out strong messages, let's look at the message Brazil is putting out to the global community. The Brazil South American country will be buckling down hard on illegal immigration with a special focus on flights Asian arriving from India. Brazil's the problem Brazil has said, found is that too many to migrants looking to enter the US and Canada point. illegally are using Brazil States as their Canada. vehicle to do so. As a result, Brazil's Ministry of Justice has recently introduced new rules for foreign nationals entering Brazilian 
Brazilian territory without a visa. The new rules state that immigrants who arrive in Brazil without an entry visa and with the intention of continuing their journey to another country must continue to their final destination or return to their country of origin immediately. Brazil's investigations have found that travelers were instructed to, while still in their own home countries, buy tickets for flights to other South American destinations with a connection or stopover in Brazil. Instead of applying for an entry visa in advance, these travelers would request asylum upon arrival in Brazil, giving up on continuing their journey. Many even got rid of their original boarding passes. Brazil's federal police also added that asylum requests jumped from a mere 69 in 2013 to 4,239 in 2023. Hopefully, this is a policy Pierre Polyev takes into strong consideration once he takes power. And now that we're talking about Canadian politics, let's talk about the one politician who has the power to affect the greatest amount of change right now. In the coming weeks, we will present our plan to rebuild a stronger, more resilient Canada. This will be our roadmap out of the pandemic towards a society that is fairer and more welcoming, towards communities that are better prepared for future crises, and towards a country where everyone is safer and healthier. As our first step to make this plan a reality, we will present a speech from the throne on Wednesday, September 23rd. This is the same week that the House of Commons was already scheduled to return. The throne speech will give us the opportunity to lay out in detail our approach going forward. It will also allow Parliament to hold a confidence vote on this new plan. Today, I have asked the Governor-General to prorogue Parliament, which must happen before any government can present a throne speech. That would be Justin Trudeau, who pundits have been saying might just bring down his own government by proroguing parliament. The Globe and Mail has reported that the Liberals do not appear too keen about adopting the Bloc Québécois' proposed motion on pensions. To call this a sticking point would be a monumental understatement. With the latest development, as well as continuing drop in the polls, Trudeau knows he's in the hardest place he could possibly be in right now. The going belief is that he'll prorogue government and use the suspension to dissolve government and, here's the big kicker, he might try to give up his position in the hopes of installing a successor in time for the coming election. Personally, I believe Trudeau is selfish enough to pull this move, but at the same time, it's not like he has many other options at his disposal. Either way, Trudeau's career in politics is living on borrowed time, and he's all out of lenders. Thank you very much for watching, and if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing.